I just want to direct your attention first of all to the um, third page where it starts does your business need a permit this is what I'm going to talk about is when you need a permit okay and you'll notice that there are three different columns city state county uh, we try to describe um, when you need to see the city clerk office, when you need to see neighborhood development services for the permits. Okay, not, and this is not on the PowerPoint, um, but that's page two, three, and four. And I want to make sure also, do, does everybody have one of these yellow packets? No? Okay. Let's make sure that you all do. Would you take one and then pass them around, please? Home occupations are um, a very specific category in and of themselves. Is there anybody here who is interested in operating a business out of their home? Yes? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me what kind of business? Yes. So um, through the very first workshop we did, well not workshop, but through the first thing we did this morning, I think I decided to do um, basically classes for children to learn cooking skills and okay. etiquette. Okay. So that would be, uh, in Iowa City, we would call that a type B home occupation. I'm going to go straight to that category then. When you have people, as you'll see in the second example, tutoring, music lessons, cooking lessons, when you have people coming to your home, you need something called a type B home occupation permit. With other types of home occupations where you don't have people coming in, perhaps you provide accounting services or you're an editor or you make crafts and sell them. You don't have people coming on a regular basis. That's a type A home occupation. You do not need a permit for that. But for the type of home occupation you're describing, you do. Uh, if you have outside employees coming in, you need something called a minor modification. This is a procedural. Uh, I guess we didn't put that on there. Um, a minor modification is a meeting. It happens in City Hall. You don't have to go to an evening meeting like with planning and zoning or the Board of Adjustment or anything like that. You just make an application saying, I want to have this occupation in my home. I'm going to have an additional employee. We have a hearing. We talk about how you minimize the interruptions in the neighborhood. Home occupations, the first thing to remember is they're self-regulating in as much as if you're creating a lot of traffic or a lot of noise, the neighbors are going to start com to complain. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? An occupation at home? Yes, well, sir. Yeah, like an online retail for the sales thing, would that be a type A then? Because you're not having people coming in the door. And stuff. Right. So you're managing online retail sales yeah. of something that you produce in your home? Um, maybe, I guess. Okay. Maybe, maybe. maybe. That kind of gets into a little sticky issue. And again, this is self-regulating. Home occupations are really intended for a use that is created in the home. Um, if you are receiving large shipments of tennis shoes that you are then going to sell to somebody else, that may create a bit of a traffic issue. You may have large vehicles coming. In, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you, on the other hand, are receiving a large shipment of plain tennis shoes, and then you're using your artistic abil ability to paint them and customize them, that's more in line with a home occupation. Okay. okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and that's really what this is about. It's about your home is in a residential neighborhood. You want the business that's conducted in your home to not disrupt that residential awesome. character. Right. So, okay? So, Yes. Um, what else? What else? What are you in the purple shirts? What are you? What does that say? We have a food truck. Food truck. Food truck. Okay. Well, don't you already have a food truck? Yes. Okay. And and so tell me what it is that you're interested in. What brings you here? Um, we are in the possibility of uh, getting us a storefront. So I wanted to know what permits was important for me to. Um, Need. Very good. Okay, great. So now we've moved completely out of home occupations into commercial uses. First of all, you want to find a commercial zone that allows restaurants. Um, there are several. There's uh, 
community commercial or CC2. There are the downtown districts, the central business zones, CB, CB2, CB5, CB10. We can look at the zoning map, show you where these commercial districts are. Mm -hmm. The very easiest thing for you to do is find a space that used to be a restaurant yes. and move in. Yes. Otherwise, if you find a space that used to be uh, retail sales and you say, I'm going to open a restaurant, you're going to need a building permit. You'll probably need to do some retrofitting as far as venting. We have very strict regulations on how you can vent. Sometimes they need to go through to an exterior wall and that through a roof. You know, that gets expensive. Yeah. And that's what we ran into. We had a, a, a space. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was a, a, a beauty supply. Oh, yeah. And um, we couldn't get it because the, uh, we had tenants living upstairs over and the end unit had uh, was facilitated by a barbershop. So we know that now. Of okay. Importance. Right. So you've experienced that already. Right. Um, you know, if you work with a realtor, perhaps they may know of some uh, restaurants that are going out of business. Um, but that's the very simplest thing, is to go into a, a use that used to be a restaurant, okay. and then you don't need a change. Change in use are the yes. three critical words okay. that you want to avoid. Okay. It, you cannot have a carry-out restaurant in a residential zone, okay? okay. If, you want to have, if you want to do a carry-out business, it's going to have to be in a commercial zone, okay? If you, on the other hand, want to cater out of your home, so yours is the only vehicle that's coming in and out, yeah. right? You could do that. If you wanted clients that you were organizing these dinners, um, perhaps you would take them to the client's home. Yes. That way the impact is distributed right. across the community, yes, right? Not everybody coming to your house. Um, Yes. Uh, kind of the same question. Uh -huh. If I make food, mm -hmm. but in a restaurant, like renting restaurant, I, I need to get a permit or a certificate. You will need? Yeah, and I, I will deliver, deliver for uh, uh -huh. the customers, mm -hmm. like my community. Right, right. So what kind of... Uh, well, you would definitely need the health department to visit, and James is going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then your, that would be an allowable home occupation. Mm -hmm. And l like, um, as we were talking about with the school example, uh, if you had an employee or employees, you would need to go through the minor modification meeting and get a type B home occupation permit, again, if you had additional employees. If you did it all by yourself, mm -hmm. um, you would not need a uh, Type B permit, okay? Um, and I'm sorry, but sir, you so yes. Mine is kind of a little bit different. With, uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe someone might have an idea. So I do, but my business is um, I have an idea of non-emergency medical transportation, but I was told that you need a license. Yes. But, and, but I don't know what. Kind. Okay, sure. Um, so let me go to that slide here real quickly. Um, so this is kind of what you're describing, sur sur surface passenger services. Um, in, in any kind of transport for people where they hire you for transport, you need to contact the city clerk's office. You get a license there. You start at the city clerk's office at City Hall, and then you come up to our office in the building department because we have restrictions on the number of vehicles you can have parked out in, in front of your home. The last thing I just want to cover very quickly, and because and, I know I'm running out of time, but when you start a business, what do you need? You need a sign. You need a sign. Uh, okay, so for your home occupations, well, you can have a sign, but it can only be one square foot in size and it cannot have lights, all right? Very small. Again, you, home occupations, you don't want to disturb the residential character of the neighborhood. Nobody wants to look at something like this in, on a house in their neighborhood, right? Right. In your commercial zones, if you get a storefront, um, call us because in different commercial zones, there are different types of signs that are permitted, okay? And we're more than happy to help you figure out, before you order anything, please, before you order any signs, contact us first, 
Um, there are size restrictions. Sometimes the lighting is, you know, not permitted, and there's just all different kinds of regulations. So call us. Um, you got my number. Um, okay. It, 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 any other questions? I know I need to turn it over to so my car. Like, yeah. A card? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can hand out all the business cards you want. Absolutely. I'm just talking about signs on the outside of buildings. Mm -hmm. Anything that's visible from a public street or a public sidewalk is regulated by the city. Okay. Can I ask you a question based on a nonprofit organization when you talk about signs? Mm -hmm. You know how if you're in the, one of those like uh, maybe malls, you know how to have all the places listed in the mall. Mm -hmm. Do we have to contact you for that as well? It depends if you can see that sign from a public street. Yes. yes. You that's can. I'm speaking about my church. Uh, oh. I'm here for this, but I'm also the administrator of the church. Okay. So I'm doing two things at one time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have, I don't know, if, okay, so you know Iowa City where Smoking Joe's and yes. uh, on Broadway. So, right. Yes. On Broadway. Right, where Subway. Yes. So Subway left and Smoky Joe's is now at that end, and our church is on the other end. Okay. So that sign there, we're thinking about maybe adding uh -huh. Rainbow worship center yeah. to that sign. Yes. So will we need to contact you yes. guys in order to be able to put that sign? Yeah. That yeah. And it's, it, it, yes. And there will probably be, at the minimum, there will be a $50 fee mm -hmm. for the sign permit. But yes, you'll need a, you'll need a permit to change the sign. Okay. Very good. Thanks, yeah. So my name is James Bechtel, and I'm an environmental health specialist at Johnson County Public Health. Um, I think you know I've got a bunch of slides, and I'll go through them just to kind of guide the conversation a little bit. But already kind of hearing some of the questions and some of the ideas, I think you know a lot of the discussion hopefully will come through more of a, a, a short Q and A. And you know after the session, if there's more questions, by all means, I'm happy to stick around and chat about some stuff. And additionally, if you want to continue the conversation on another day. Um, that's also um, something that we promote and do and, and, and hope to hear from you about. So the food program, i um, just give you, a, uh, I'll just do a quick background. Um, uh, we're within the public health department. We have director uh, Dave Coach and the food program fits under just the umbrella of environmental health. And so there's things like water, radon, tattoos, handing, all the things that have to do with kind of this built environment, environmental health pieces, um, food fits in there. Um, I'm the second one on the list of the environmental specialists. There's three other um, inspectors that do very similar things um, that I do um, all throughout the entire county. Um, there's different kind of territories, different areas. So depending on where you want to open up a business or who, you know, what you want to end up doing, you might talk to any one of us. We don't have kind of one person. It's, it's based up um, a little bit on geography. Um, and so predominantly what you'll kind of think about with food protection is conducting inspections or this idea of like a food inspector and going out and throughout the community, going into restaurants, grocery stores, doing things like that. But the responsibilities of this position really do a lot of other things. And one of the main things, um, you know, top and maybe bottom is looking at consultation and educational services. One of the things that we've been doing a lot more of is making sure that we're having conversations before something gets too far along or before you know the, uh, the permits are already being uh, 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 applied for or perhaps the construction's already beginning. Because if we can get early enough in that conversation, we can usually guide you down a path that we think is the easiest way through this process to get you up and running to what you want to do. And that's maybe creating a, a food truck or creating a new restaurant or preparing home foods, doing those type of things. And the earlier we are in that conversation, usually the better. But we have lots of other kind of responsibilities and, and job duties and kind of outlined up there. But really, you know, the way we work is we are bureaucrats. We do, um, you know, type things. But where we get our authority is from the state. State of Iowa has the ability and, and, and the responsibility to regulate food within the state of Iowa. We contract with them, and so we hold the contract for pretty much all food regulation within Johnson County. Um, and how we do that is by looking at kind of model code. So there's a, a, lots and lots of people participate um, all across the U.S. and create this model code, this 2013 U.S. Um, food code. And the state of Iowa chooses to adopt the things from there. And so 
when we always reference food code, it's, it's, it's pretty much, a, a, for the most part, a very standardized set of rules and standardized set of things that we want to um, uh, make sure that you're adhering to. And they're, they're law, they're, they're put into law. And so these are things that you have to follow um, if you want to participate in the selling of food. Um, it's very big, it's very ex expansive. There's lots of definitions. There's you know, so much in there that it's, it's really, um, it's not our expectation that you guys are experts in this. And that's why we spend the time that we do going through this material. And when you guys have questions, we try to take what's in those pieces and what's in those um, uh, regulations, what's in that code, and try to communicate that to you. So what that means for you on your kind of decision to, to move forward on a specific venture. But where all this kind of comes from is this idea of preventing foodborne illness. So we're not in it to just have lots of laws and lots of regulations and lots of things to check through. The whole idea behind this is this idea of preventing foodborne illness. And really where the science has moved towards, and it really is a scientific based piece, is we're just reducing risk. You know, we're taking something that's a low chance and trying to work with you to make it even lower. So, you know, the, depending on your, your familiarity or excitement of talking about statistics, we're trying to take like one in 600,000 type chances and cut those things in half. So you could serve 600,000 dishes in a given year and not have a statistical likelihood of, 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 of creating a scenario in which foodborne illness is likely to occur. And so I think that that's really what you know, our main drive is to continue, continue to lower that, that potential risk. Okay, and so how do we do that? Evaluating food safety practices, um, you know, can, looking at plan reviews, the idea of you, know, you have an idea of what you wanna do and so we'll look through that plan, talk through that plan with you. Um, some education, especially when we're on site. Um, you know, if we find something that uh, is, is not being done with the best practices or that could be improved, you know, we'll work with managers, owners, food handlers, and then also making sure that we're communicating those things to the public so that they understand what the, the kind of level of expectations are in any given food establishment and that they can purchase, you know, food from any vendor within the, the community and have this expectation of a certain level of, of safety. And then also kind of um, a good portion of it, but it's also just follow up on complaints. So when we get information from the community, we're, as I showed earlier, just four people um, that are regulating and going throughout all of the food establishments within Johnson County. We can't be everywhere at the same time. We only get a certain amount of time in there. And so we use the information that comes in from customers, citizens, consumers throughout the county to, to help drive some of our, what we're looking at and um, what we're doing kind of why it's important, we talked about foodborne illness, or I mentioned that that's really our main driving forces to reduce that chance of illness. One in six, you know, Americans, that's 50 million people a year get sick with a foodborne illness. Um, 3,000 deaths, and that's, those are pretty steady numbers um, that have been going on for the last decade or so. Looking at one specific pathogen, we're not gonna go too deep, and um, I guess I should, mentioned that there's lots of pictures and these are all pictures that happen in Johnson County. There's things that, you know, that are occurring, you know, not great practices uh, that are occurring that can lead to, you know, maybe some of these numbers, um, potentially and nationally looking at what the cost associated with those things are. And so what our goal is, is to make sure that we're working with you as um, uh, potential persons in charge, owners of, of licenses, to make sure that those scenarios um, don't happen within our community um, or our region. Okay, so we kind of had some questions about uh, what permits and what things are needed from the city. There are a few things that from our side, um, from the health department to sell food, you would not need a food license. You might need a business license or a permit um, to operate within a different city or a different municipality. But from a food perspective, um, if you're just selling vegetables, whole and uncut things, by all means, you can set up a stand anywhere from our perspective and sell those. Um, we have no um, requirements on uncut items. Commercially processed, shelf-stable, prepackaged food items. So candy bars, if you buy a bunch of candy bars and want to open up a candy bar store, you would not need to get a license from the food side. Again, the municipality, a city, or um, another entity might have a regulation about what type of things you can do within a house or within a different um, type of zoned area, but you would not need a food license. 
And then lastly, there is a, a small piece about like some baked food items. And this is really, really limited. It's baked items. It's making breads, cookies, things that are really devoid of water. So the science says there's not a lot of stuff that can go wrong with these. And so long as you're selling them directly from your, the place that you produce them, there wouldn't be a license needed. If you end up going into cookies with a frosting on them or an ice cream cookie or moving into like an injected pastry, then you start moving into where you need a license. So it's really just to facilitate those that make some baked items and, and, and allow kind of some of those things that we know are, are low risk items. Okay, now here's where we get into uh, kind of showing what, who, who needs a license. Anybody who's selling or serving food, there used to be kind of this idea that you had to be selling food. And so if you're a nonprofit or you're giving things away or you were um, doing it with a good mission in there, then you, know, you thought you might be a little bit exempt, but that's not anywhere in state statute. That's not anywhere in our codes. And so really, if you open up a bag of dried beans, put it into a smaller bag and hand those out to the community, technically you are serving food at that point. And so that's a pretty extreme example, but th there is a, a nonprofit in Johnson County that has gone through the process of obtaining a food license, and I'll talk a little bit about it, so that they can have approved source food. So when they're doing that activity, all of the people downstream of them can purchase from them or obtain free food from them, and it's a licensed approved source thing. And so. I think that that's one big thing to think about. It's not just about selling food or, you know, if you have an educational mission to, you know, cultural experience or, you know, some other mission in there that doesn't um, exclude you from this idea of needing a license. And so there is a couple little pieces about nonprofit and that's like one a year type of events or a very small number of events. We can go into the details there if you do have like a church or a nonprofit that you want to explore those, but it's a very narrow exemption in there and then also those things that I talked a little bit about before that are always just kind of exempt. And so then when we're talking about food, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, you had that um, whole uncut commodities, those like a whole apple or a whole potato. For some reason, the, the, the US government puts that into one branch, the USDA, and says that that's a commodity crop. If you cut it in half, it turns into food. And so it starts to meet into this this type of definition. And for whatever reason, at the state of Iowa, they had a really good discussion and had to slip in chewing gum because it didn't fit into any of these definitions. So if you're providing chewing gum, it has to be in there. And um, what a narrow definition that was. But you know, it's really, there's a lot of things. So raw, cooked, processed, ice, beverage. If in the, um, one example is in the Summer of the Arts. When Iowa City has a bunch of events, they have these hydration stations for people to be able to fill up their water bottles. They go through and get a license for water. They, people are pouring water since it's not a sealed thing. It technically meets our definition of food. So they pull out a license to, to serve water. Um, OK, so here's where we get into type of license. And this is going to be an overview. Um, what, I'll, what I'll recommend everybody do is once you kind of start getting your ideas and you start thinking about what you want to do and getting those things defined and down on paper, which is one of the main intents of what you're doing here today. As soon as you start doing that, then that's a good time to come talk to us because we want to fit everything into categories and we want to be able to define what your type of operation is or what type of license that you might end up needing. But very generally, and I'll cover up this one right now, um, most of the things are restaurants or maybe some mobile units, grocery store, and so those are kind of the main things. But we do have some home bakery license, a vending machine um, license. Uh, farmer's market, I spent most of my morning at the farmer's market this morning going through and, and, and doing inspections there. Um, farmer's market's a really unique, awesome defined thing that the state um, put into code like 35 years ago or so, that they allow certain things that can occur in here that you can't do anywhere else. Like you could go make your jams and pressure seal them and stuff like that and sell them at a farmer's market, but you can't do that really anywhere else, you know, in any of those other licenses. So farmer's market's a pretty unique one, um, interesting. Temporary food establishments, and so that's really, and I'll go into a little bit more depth, but that's that temporary kind of food tent, maybe associated with a civic event or some sort of sporting event or that type of thing. Um, but depending on what you want to do, if you want to be serving kind of food and having customers, most of the, all of these are the licenses that we will work with you to get you going through. 
manufactured food. So if you wanted to make a salsa in a building on your um, property and, and seal it all up, you likely, and, and then maybe you sell it at a, a grocery store within the community or you go sell them to other restaurants and they use your, your product, you're gonna be in this kind of food processing, manufactured food, and that's the state. The state just handles all those because there's not a whole lot of them. Usually they're giant processing facilities, but there's lots of them across uh, Johnson County that are um, very small batch uh, producers and, and the state handles that licensing directly. But you know, we, we, we would work with the individual until we kind of pass them on to the state to make sure that it's a, the right fit. Um, and so I'll just kind of run through these, but the retail food establishment, this is your traditional restaurant, your traditional um, on-site premises consumption. So when we're talking about you know, people coming in and eating the food, sitting down in, in a space, you're looking at this food service establishment. Um, food establishment, so we pulled that word service out of there. And so really it's the services like kind of the on-site, you're providing a food service to the people around you. Um, this is the, the license that fits with that maybe off-site consumption. And so you could have, you know, you're producing a, making a grocery store, something that where there's not really this implied on-site sale um, or on-site consumption piece to it. And so that's kind of the two pieces. Oftentimes people put those two together. Um, so a giant grocery store that has maybe a little diner in it and a bunch of shelves full of things for off-site off, uh, um, consumption. And so they hold both these licenses. Um, you can intermix and match all these things. Home bakery. Um, so there's the so there's a mention of some moldy pie earlier. The the home baked items, and they just recently changed this to where you can sell up to thirty five thousand dollars under this license. It used to be twenty thousand dollars until this summer. And so this is where if you wanted to make a bunch of things that are going to be consumed elsewhere or purchased elsewhere. So if you wanted to make a bunch of wonderful cookies and have them sell, sold at restaurants throughout the community, you could get this type of license, but again, you're limited to a certain type of menu. You couldn't make like cold cut sandwiches or steak sandwiches and, and, and distribute those from your home. Mobile food units, and so this is kind of the, the food truck or the push cart, and so it's a self-contained operation. It's readily movable. It's not like a, a trailer that's just with no wheels off in the edge of, of, of a town or in a parking lot. It's something that can move, and we do test that because there's been a huge growth in those, and we need to make sure that by going down this route that we're not creating greater risks than um, what would be done in a restaurant. And so. Most of those always will have an annual inspections and oftentimes if you are interested in doing a mobile cart, you can't do everything on the cart and so you need to have another place and as uh, Aliko was mentioning, she found a kitchen where she does a lot of the preparation, a lot of the stuff and then she loads it up into the unit and then kind of finishes things off the day of the sales that are occurring and so that's the most common way in which people operate a mobile food unit there but there's a few that can do everything, very simple menus and they just do everything on the truck kind of the day of but it's Logistically, it doesn't really work, and we've seen that there's been some kind of um, difficulties with complying with some of the rules when you don't have those extra spaces to prepare food in them. Right. Temporary food, and so this is the, the tent or the civic event, um, some of the arts, rag bri, fair, where people set up in one place and kind of uh, have a very set menu again of things that they're preparing, um, but it's no more than 14 consecutive days, um, and, and you're getting basically an inspection for each time that you're gonna be executing that. Um, and so, as we were, the whole, you know, we do these inspections to see what's going on after we've opened something up. And the idea behind this is to continually to make sure that as you're evolving and what's going on is that you're, continually engaging in that, that kind of um, information or education of the, the services that you're providing or the food that you're providing. Um, and by going through this process, we start to see lots of things and we learn about what's working, what isn't working, what isn't feasible. And so we see lots and lots of things that aren't good practices and, and become violations, become issues that do have impact of you keeping those licenses once they're open. And so that's why you know, we, we learn a lot through this inspection process and we try to bring that to those early conversations. So when we're giving you recommendations or when we're saying you know, there's certain things that you should be thinking about, it tries to control for those moldy pies and, and bad you know, setups in the, in, in the places. So um, we won't go too much into the types, uh, but there's kind of the before you open, we talk a lot. 
then we turn a license on and say, good luck. You know, go compete with all the people that are out there. Um, good practices, you have minimum levels of standards, but there's some, some stuff that we have to do before you open, and then while you're open, we'll conduct routine inspections. So we try to do it based on the risk. So if somebody's doing sushi you know, uh, operation, that's much different than if somebody was just open up a bag of chips and maybe uh, throwing some cold meat onto a, a sandwich. And so we go to the one that is riskier a lot more frequently than the ones that we would go to that are a lot lower risk or uh, you know, that has a lot less chance of having those, those potential issues. But then once we've done a routine, anytime we see any of those photos or anytime we see some of those practices that need to be monitored or need to be followed up, we'll end up doing some sort of follow-up or reinspection, um, or those things will likely result or come from the, a piece of investigation for a suspected foodborne illness or some conditions that are related to that. So yes? There, so there are some um, cities around the country that actually place, you know, I guess the A's, the yep. B's, the C's, or yep. the F's yep. on doors and businesses closed. Is there a reason why... I don't know if mm. Iowa does. I don't think Iowa City has it. But yep. There's um, so the state of Iowa. Yeah. Yes. Um, the last couple slides, we'll we I'll show you where you can tap into some of that information. Mm -hmm. There's some mixed scientific evidence of whether that those scores have an impact on the behaviors of um, in an establishment. And so they do help inform, like getting an A or a B or a C or maybe a, a composite score out of a 100 you know, type of thing. Um, those do have an impact. Uh, but then what happens is the establishments learn how to kind of gamify or how to get the minimum score so they know which things that they need to do in order to get that B or B minus or to get that passing score. And so what the state of Iowa and the chief inspector of the state has always said is that they aren't interested in getting people just to find that minimum level of the score that they're happy with to continue it. They want any of the things that are identified as, as, a, as a violation to be followed up on. And so the whole goal is it's not to achieve perfection, but it's be the, the pursuit of it, the pursuit of continually making sure that these things are being addressed. There's ways to calculate them, and there's things out there that you can look to turn what our inspection report looks like into composite scores, but they haven't chosen to go down that route about doing that statewide, because then it becomes, how do you calculate that I'll composite score? Yep. I, I think there are two restaurants next to each other, and they're both sandwich shops. Yep. One is an A, one is a B. I'm not going to go to the B. Yep, yep, and I think that that's, there's some really cool stuff in like Seattle um, that went through that process of that, where, but they took a really long time to um, uh, implement that, and what they found is that the variability between inspectors had a huge impact on those scores, rather than being a, a, an objective criteria that achieves those those scores and so we look for those risk factors kind of the good retail practices for sanitation smooth surfaces those type of things and those are all things that we work with you at the beginning in order to avoid having violations you know later on um, whole goal is to generate information that the public can use um, you know we have a minimum level that we don't want imminent health hazards but it's also to generate inspection information and so if you go to that website um, or johnsoncounty.com, um, go to the public health section, you can find all of our report information and all of those pictures are associated with violations and all of that information is available to you. Not all the pictures, but all the information that's associated with that. And that's where it'll end up looking like and so I encourage you if you're interested at all to look on the inspection side. But additionally, this is also where you'll get all of food establishment information. So if you're looking to apply or you're trying to find some guidance material, um, trying to find um, application material, that's directly where you want to go. And I will open up for questions, but I'll actually probably pass it over and, and know that you know we can have a conversation afterwards because there were some really interesting concepts that you know when working with the city or working with the county building or zoning office, um, there might be some things that are okay with the city but doesn't meet the definition of food or vice versa that we say is okay from a food perspective but it might not be allowed in certain parts of the city and so i think that that's maybe one of the hardest things that i've seen from your guys perspective from an entrepreneurial perspective of a small business is understanding that line and and who you need to talk to and what's allowed maybe in one versus the other and we try to work really hard with our partners um, on the building services or you know working on that to make sure that there's good understanding but i think that that's a difficult thing for, for new individuals to go through, and maybe you could even open it up for kind of what your experience was um, on that. But. Does anyone know what Legal Aid is? Yes. Okay, great. We, 
Great, I'm happy. <laughs> we provide legal services for free to people with civil legal problems. So civil essentially is non-criminal. So if you get arrested for something or if you're concerned about police action, we're not usually generally able to help you. But if you have like a landlord tenant issue or you have a tax issue or a divorce or newly um, small business issues, we may be able to help you with that. We have a new grant that allows us to help small business owners um, develop their business, how it is formed legally, um, and how to sort of minimize risk within your business and your personal life. This is a new project for us, uh, but we have started talking with people about how is the best way to form your business. But legally, there's different ways you can form a business. It could be an LLC, it could be a corporation. Um, it depends on your specific situation, on what type of entity your business should be. There are different um, positives and negatives depending on how many people there are. How are you going to deal with money? how many cities you're going to be involved in, things like that. Obviously, there's additional legal issues with businesses, like when you're renting property, or if you're renting your space, or dealing with your taxes. Taxes actually come up a lot. I'm one of our tax attorneys, and we have a lot of people who have small businesses who haven't necessarily known how to do their taxes the way you should when you have a business and when, when you're a person as well. And so we can help you navigate from the get-go so you don't run into problems later. Because it's easy to mess it up and then have to deal with it later. If that's the case, you can always come to us as well. Um, but if you can get us at the beginning so we can help you on the right path to have less problems, that's the sort of goal. So today I'm mostly here just to let you guys know that we're available, that if you have questions about the legal side of things, you're welcome to come and apply for our assistance. You can come to our office. We have an Iowa City office. We also have a Cedar Rapids office. We have 10 locations throughout the state. Is anyone not from Iowa City or Cedar Rapids? From Cedar Rapids. You're from Cedar Rapids? Yep, we have one in Des Moines as well. So um, our Cedar Rapids office is downtown. Um, our Iowa City office is in East El Plaza, which is also where you get your driver's license, that building. Yeah. Yep, and so we're open 8.30 to 4.30 if you want to walk in or you can call. Sometimes it can be take a little while to get through on the phone, so walking in um, can be faster. Do you take appointments there? If you yeah. walk in and say, I'd like to come back at this time. We usually generally can find out who will be available to talk with you at that time. Can you apply online for the business aspect too? Yes, you can apply online for any help you need. Okay. It just might take a little longer. So if you have something urgent, the fastest thing to do is just to come to the office. Yeah. OK? Yeah. And just so you know, our online application currently doesn't work on a cell phone. I have a lot of people who are like, it's not working. I'm like, are you on a cell phone? I'm sorry. We're trying to update it. So try to use a browser or um, at the library or somewhere, or you can just can come in. You can use a laptop, yeah. yep. So like I talked about, we can review how your business is currently created, if it's an LLC or who the members are, or is it a corporation, or if you want to start one, we can help you figure out what's the best option for you. We can help you identify any current legal issues you have or something that might happen and how you can resolve them. And then obviously we want to talk about future legal problems to sort of avoid them. So these are sort of things we can help with. Like I've talked about the choice of business entity. It's going to be different for everyone. Um, what a contract says when you get one, to review it, what things you should look for, what might be a problem down the road for you, um, how you are with employing people or if how you employ them. Are they uh, an employee or are they sort of a contractor who just does this one thing for you and that's all they're doing? How to plan your finances and how to plan your risk. So with every business comes risk, especially financially. How do you minimize that for your business and for yourself personally? That's sort of a legal issue and that goes with what kind of business entity you want to be. Um, how taxes work. It um, can be pretty confusing, 
But if you talk to someone right away, that way you know what you're doing, I would say that's the best thing to do, is talk to someone right at the front end when you start having to pay taxes for your business. If you need to copyright anything, if you have trouble with the permits, you've learned a lot today about the different permits. Um, and then if the business owes debt, or if you are owed debt as a business, how does that work? So I think this mostly says what we've talked about. Um, you always want to make sure that you are complying with all the regulations and the permits that there are, so we can help you sort of navigate that with your own business if um, you still have questions after talking to the city or the county. And then obviously all leases and contracts can be pretty confusing, especially when you first start reading them. Once you get more used to them, you'll understand them a little more, but at the beginning, um, it's sort of a learning curve, trying to figure out what does all this mean and what does it mean for my business. And I just want to give you guys an overview of what we can help you with. Because I'm an attorney, we have different rules about what I can um, talk to you about in front of other people, so I won't be able to answer your specific legal questions today. The others are better at um, talking about what permit you can use. Um, but legal questions are a lot more complex, so if you guys want to talk to someone, just come by, and then we'll find out exactly what's going on with your business so we can give you the best advice from an attorney. OK? So I think we'll just um, open it up for questions for anyone. Is there an uh, income maximum or income that to use? Generally, our income guidelines are based on the poverty scale for the whole country. So it's about 125% of poverty. It depends. Sometimes there are higher income limits based on the situation, like taxes. We have a different ones. We just have different um, grants, and some of them have different income guidelines. My question is, what, are, what should I be looking for? Yeah, I think um, what we view it as is there's certain um, codes, regulations, certain things, certain standards that need to be in place. And so um, if a, an existing establishment was, a, uh, say, a restaurant or something, you know, had a food license, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can walk in and in the and and start start that next day right. that there's likely a, a, a there's a, a chance that improvements will be needed to be made in that space and then when we say improvements oftentimes it's not prescriptive that you have to put this specific piece of equipment in there but we will say that you know those things need to be communicated about what you want to do and the type of equipment then when you go to look at putting those things in, it's oftentimes that building services would be the, the entity that you would need to talk to because permits might need to be pulled for that location. Um, I was just in a place on Friday that was opening up an expansion of an existing establishment. They had a license, they had an occupancy permit, they were already operating, they've already done, they were just adding an extra space to their place. By doing it, they had to talk about sprinklers and fire systems. They put that all in the new place. But by expanding, they then now opened up the non-conforming existing operation. And now we're going through the process of updating all of those systems on a place that was existing. And so I think that it is a, a delicate balance, and especially if you're working with a, a realtor or identifying you know, an, a third party to find these locations, that the, there's pressures to move quick. 
but I think it's important to, to have good channels of communication with you know, building services, with the health department. Um, we can't green light you know, without a lot of information. Right. So we want those plans, we want those things submitted so we can sit down, look at them, see what the impact would be, look at your menu and how you want to use that space. And then obviously the city has lots of standards or lots of pieces in there. So I think. Yeah, I'll add to that just a little bit. Um, to add to that just a little, James made me think about something that a, a lot of people do not anticipate, and that is if you find a small space that works brilliantly for your business, um, but it's in a large building, you may need to hire an architect or a structural engineer to sign off on the building plans yes. for any kind of expansion, or if it's a business that did not... Um, if it's a business that had a very limited food preparation design, like maybe the, the cold sandwiches and, um, I don't know, maybe pasta salads or something, but you're coming in and you're doing a lot more cooking, you, even though you're restaurant to restaurant, uh, you may need to install the ventilation. Again, right, exactly, exactly. So. Um, we will work with people. Uh, we have uh, access to building plans, past permits in our office. If you come in and you give us an address and you want to look at a specific location, we'll see what we have. And we can look at the layout, whether or not it's already got a sprinklering system, um, how many exits there are in and out of the space, how many bathrooms you might need, that changes when you add seating area, you may need to add restrooms. So we can go over the records that we have, all right? You may still get an unwelcome surprise at the end, like I think I know where you're talking about, and sometimes things aren't anticipated and unfortunately unfortunately that sounds like a very expensive surprise so but come in will you do pre-inspections too yeah we'll do we'll do consultations or walkthroughs oftentimes we'll um, meet somebody on site of a place that they may not have um, a lease in, in place or they haven't purchased a place just to talk through it because it is so much easier to have a conversation about the ideas again that's not us saying like a stamp of approval but we can explain some of those maybe big picture things and the, some of those ideas that you might need to think about before you start putting too much you know, financial commitment or risk uh, um, commitment into, into a place. And then one thing I guess I also just touched to mention is just because it was an existing operation doesn't mean all of the work that was done to get it to there meets code or was done by approved individuals that might look great from the surface, but as soon as you start opening up walls or looking under or above ceiling tiles, that sometimes there are big ticket deficiencies about how that work was executed. And, and that's where I think the, the kind of the risk kind of conversation is, is important is because yet you need to have enough ability to get through those, those uh, big ticket costs or those big adjustments because those are, yeah, they, some of those things you can't move through or you can't get a, a, a building permit or occupancy permit or a license until some of those things are adjusted and, and there's only so much money that can go around. And so I think that that's, it, it's just important to, to talk early with as much information as you know. Yeah, I, I wanted to add too, our building inspectors will, will agree to go to some of these spaces if you wanna do a walkthrough of a vacant space. But after a certain point in time, you're gonna hear, you may hear, you need a licensed professional, you need a licensed professional. So they know when to, they have to stop giving information at a certain time because as, as James said, we can't green light right. a project. Right. But, um, I would just wanna, before you leave, I wanna say Tracy says thank you. Thank you very much for attending and please put your evaluation form in the basket at the check-in desk. Thank you. Thank you all for you. attending. If you have questions about food side of things, um, you know you can contact me directly. But I think the best way to get in touch with us is just to contact the public. Talk to somebody about food because we are running around oftentimes, and it, some questions are best answered generally. Um, and then sometimes we might say start applying, and then we'll get that specific individual connected with you, and then they'll be able to get into the details um, on a much deeper level.